ハレルヤ。So, brothers and sisters, the church has been going through a rough stretch lately. A lot of us Catholics have been grieving over the situation in the church.、Uh, right now, we're just wrapping up some meetings in the Vatican, dealing with just the, 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 the problems in the church. And some people get very discouraged. They think about leaving the church. They wonder if they can trust anyone in the church. And one of my typical responses or questions to people who, who are thinking about leaving is I ask them, Have you ever learned anything about the history of the church? Are you aware at all of, of, of our history? Because if you know about the history of the church, you know we've been here before. <laughs> This is not the first time we've been through. You know, struggles and things like that. And it's important for us to, to, to just have a perspective. You know, the Lord calls us indeed to be merciful, but we also have to reconcile this with there's times you need to make a whip and clean out the, the, the temple, you know? And so it's just helpful to look back over the hundreds of years of church history and kind of get a bit of perspective. So, I thought what I would do today is share with you a little story of one of the tough times the church has been through. And I want to begin in March of the year 1378, hundreds of years ago. March 1378, a new pope was just elected, Pope Urban VI. And one of the first things Pope Urban did, because he was elected in a very difficult time in the church, a time in some ways very similar to our time. The, the, the things going on in the church today were going on in the church back then too. And, and, and after he was elected, he, he, he needed some encouragement. So he called for, he summoned a young woman. A young woman from Siena, 31 years old, named, named Catherine. And he summoned her, and, 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 and he, when she came, he, he, he asked her for some advice and some encouragement. And so she offered the Pope some words of encouragement. She exhorted him, she inspired him, and he was so inspired, he called, he called the cardinals who were, who were around. He, said, he, he asked her, Preach to the cardinals. <laughs> so she preached to the cardinals. And after she was finished preaching to the cardinals, the Pope said to the cardinals, You see, why are we so fearful? Why can't we be more like Catherine, who's, who's fearless in, 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 in these situations? Now imagine that. Imagine that. Crisis in the church, what do we do? We call a 31 year old woman to come and, and give us encouragement and even to preach to the cardinals. Now, who was this? Woman, St. Catherine of Siena, one of the most remarkable women saints of the church, who many people are talking about today, by the way. We're all talking about St. Catherine of Siena. And many people are discovering St. Catherine of Siena for the first time and falling in love with her. I'm one of those people. St. Catherine of Siena was the 24th. Of 25 children. Some of you mothers think you're tough. <laughs> Talk to Catherine of Siena's mom. Her name was Lapa. 25 children. And at the age of five, Catherine learned to say the Hail Mary. And she, she got in the habit of when she was going up the stairs, she would kneel and pray a Hail Mary on each one of the stairs. So already at a young age, She had a, a devotion to our Lord and to Our Lady and a sense of the spiritual. At the age of six years old, she received, you could say, her calling. She had a defining moment where she, she received her, what her calling would be in, in, in her life. She was walking with her older brother through the streets of Siena, and over the church of, of, run by the Dominicans, She had a vision where she saw Jesus. And Jesus was dressed up like a pope. He was wearing the, the pope's outfit. And St. Peter was with Jesus, St. Paul, and also John, the beloved disciple, which is very significant. And the Lord Jesus blessed her. 
And with that, she was filled with this tremendous love for God. And, and this, this kind of set her on even a, 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 a deeper seeking and loving of God. So much so that the next year, at the age of seven, she consecrated herself to the Lord. She took a vow of perpetual virginity at the age of seven, which isn't recommended. You wait, wait a little longer, but she's an exception. And then later, when she finally reached the age of marriage, her parents wanted to marry her off. So they, you know, started finding young men and all of that. And she made it very clear, no way. It's not going to happen. I made a vow of perpetual virginity. I've consecrated myself to God. I'm not getting married. And her parents didn't like that, so they gave her a hard time. And they, they kind of, you know, were, were hard on her for, for, for quite an amount of time. They, they, they made her do all the, the work of, uh, that, that the servants would do, and, and she couldn't have her own room because she, she would always want to go off and pray alone. So she couldn't have her own room. She had, a, had to share a room with her siblings, and they couldn't break her. She was un, 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 unstoppable. She just, she just would not get it out of her mind to be consecrated to God. So much so that one day, she cut all of her hair off. And apparently she had very beautiful hair. So she cut all of her hair off and put a cap on. And her mother saw this, Italian mother. Mother saw this and she took the cap off and saw you know, all her hair gone. And she shrieked. And Catherine took her cap back, put it on, and walked away. <laughs> rebellious teenager. <clears throat> but finally the parents, they gave up. They gave up and she became a third order Dominican. So she didn't, she didn't become like a nun in a convent, you know, like uh, um, w- 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 taking the, all of those vows and that, but she became kind of like a, a lay religious, a Dominican, and, and including she had a, a habit she wore as a third order Dominican. And she was finally given, especially by her dad. Her dad finally said, listen, Catherine, she can do whatever she wants. She has her own room, and, and no one bug her. And so she had her own room where she could pray all she wanted and do all the penance and all that she wanted. Um, and she, for three years, she, for three years, she basically um, didn't talk to anyone. For three years, she, she spent, her, her, the only place she would spend her time was in her room, or going to church, and she barely slept. You see, she was devoted to the Dominicans. St. Dominic had, had, had uh, recently died, and the, the, the new Dominican order was into uh, evangelizing and preaching, and she was so in love with the vision of the, of the Dominicans and St. Dominic, when she was younger, she wanted to pretend, like she wanted to disguise herself as a man and secretly join them. That was her dream, you know? Um, but she was so devoted to the Dominicans that she would pray all night while the Dominican brothers were sleeping. And when when, when they would wake up at, you know, early in the morning, that was her indication that she could take a little rest. She slept about half an hour, or, or rather 15 minutes a day. Half an hour every two days. She 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 barely um, she barely ate. She was did a lot of penance, um, a lot of mortification. The Lord was getting her ready for a huge mission. After three years, like she thought that her vocation was to simply live like this. She was inspired by the, the early desert fathers, the Egypt, uh, Egyptian monks, and, 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 and she, she thought, I'm just going to live like this. I'm going to live a life of sacrifice, of penance for the Dominican preachers, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live a hidden life. But then the Lord called her to go out into the world and to begin to, to, be, to, begin to, to proclaim him and to begin to, 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 to do the, the works of God in the world, and she resisted. She said, Lord... I'm a woman. Now again, you have to understand, at her time, women were not involved in politics. They they, they weren't involved that much in the affairs of the world, and they certainly weren't preaching to the cardinals. They certainly weren't advisors to the pope. But the Lord said to her, he said, in these later days, there has been, now listen, ladies, 
There has been such an upsurge of pride, especially in the case of men who imagine themselves to be learned or wise, that my justice cannot endure them any longer without delivering a just chastisement upon them that will bring them to confusion. To confound their arrogance, I will raise up women endowed with strength and divine wisdom. You see, when she told the Lord that as a woman she couldn't do all these things, the Lord said to her, just like the angel Gabriel said to the Blessed Virgin Mary, for me, nothing's impossible. The Lord said to Catherine, don't tell me what I can't do. If I send you, you're gonna go. The Lord also said to her, your heart will burn so strongly for the salvation of your fellow men that you will forget that you're a woman and change you forget your, your, your gender, and don't, she, she wasn't confused about her gender, be assured. You will forget your sex and change your present way of life. You will not avoid the company of men and women as you do now. But for the salvation of their souls will take, up, take upon yourself every kind of labor. Many people will be scandalized by the things you do and oppose you so that the thoughts of their hearts may be revealed. And it says, the Lord repeated to her over and over again, you must not be anxious or afraid. This is something that was was seared deep in the depths of of St. Catherine of of Siena. The Lord's command, don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. And as a matter of fact, you know how Father Stan Fortuna taught us, and David Bosono confirmed this yesterday, The the whole of the spiritual life is get over yourself. And the heart of St. Catherine of Siena's teaching was the reality that I'm nothing and God is everything. And the Lord told her, if you can keep that clear in your mind, no evil will be able to touch you. In other words, if you can get over yourself and not be anxious, not be afraid, nothing can touch you. The Lord also said to her, You must change, again, she was living in her little cell, doing her prayer, her penance, her fasting, her vigil, vigils. He said to her, you must change your present way of life. Your cell must not be a home to you any longer. Instead, for the good of souls, you will have to leave even your own city. I shall be with you always in your goings out and your comings in. And you will carry my doctrine and the honor of my name to high and low, to lay folk, clerics, and religious. I shall put a kind of wisdom in your mouth that none will be able to resist. I will lead you before popes, before the heads of the Christian church and its people. And through the weak, as is my custom, I shall humble the pride of the powerful." That's what the Lord told her. So what she, she began to do is she began to follow the promptings of the Spirit and leave her cell. And she began by caring for the sick and caring for the dying in, in, in a most remarkable way and just followed the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And people began to discover her. In particular, the powerful way the Lord was working through her. They say that the miracles that surrounded her, you would have to write a a whole number of books to to, to just describe all of the miracles around this holy woman of God, this holy young woman of God. She died at the age of 33. Most of her apostles, she was in her 20s. She began when she was around 21. She experienced, or was experienced around her very often, the multiplying of food, food for the poor, on a large scale sometimes. They even experienced the multiplying of wine more than once. Lord, let that happen today again. Again, she would only sleep about 15 minutes every night. She barely ate. Towards the, uh, the end of her life, she lived off of the Eucharist. She says, when I receive the Eucharist, it takes away all hunger. I, don't, I, I can't eat food, worldly food. After she would receive the Eucharist, she would typically go into ecstasy for about two to three hours. 
They had to schedule, you know, can we go to Mass? Because if we go to Mass, we have to leave around three hours for her ecstasy, you know, and if the church is going to close, and uh, it, it, remarkable. She had a tremendous uh, uh, gift of prophecy, and, and she would receive words of knowledge. Um, she performed exorcisms. She could smell the stench of sin. There's a number of saints in the church who had that gift. If you were in, in mortal sin, this, you know, she could smell it. She could tell that you needed to go to confession. She had a, a, a wonderful mystical experiences that you can read in her book called The Dialogues. And she, she spoke about the things of God. She was a preacher. She would, she would preach. And they say when she would go to a place to preach under the command of God, um, people would just come from far and wide. And they said it was like angels were sounding a trumpet or something. Just pe people would just come and hear her preach, and her preaching was so powerful. There were so many conversions through her preaching um, that the Pope assigned priests, giving them full faculties, the, the same faculties a bishop would have in his diocese, full faculties to absolve all sins. And these priests would, would go with her just to, to hear the confessions of the, the countless people who would be converted um, through, through her preaching. She... she um, she had a, she was, her, her life was so inspiring and so, so beautiful that she always had a crowd of disciples who followed her wherever she went, you know? Like when she would, would be invited to go somewhere, there was always a crowd that went with her, you know? And um, it, it's kind of amusing because these people, they would go wherever she went without any thought of where they would, where they would sleep where they would get food, all that. They just lived on Providence, but they, they preferred to be around St. Catherine of Siena and all the wonders around her than to live their, you know, boring lives at home. So it's, it's, it's remarkable how she would always uh, have a little crowd around her. Um, but going back to Pope Urban VI, who I began with, who summoned her when he was first elected pope, she was 31 years. The reason Pope Urban VI knew about Catherine of Siena is because before he was pope, he was in Avignon. And that's where Pope Gregory XI spent a lot of his time. And when Pope Gregory XI was in Avignon, she, he had St. Catherine as a kind of a, a, a advisor. She'd come and she'd exhort him. And that's where uh, Pope Urban, as an archbishop, got to know Catherine and was very impressed with her. And... It was remarkable that, again, in her 20s, St. Catherine of Siena uh, would advise Pope Gregory. Pope Gregory, they said he was a bit of a, you know, he, he's a bit of a fearful pope. He, he didn't want to be in Rome because there was a little bit of tension and it was a little dangerous for him to be in Rome. And so he stayed in Avignon where there was a lot of people who liked him and would protect him. And St. Catherine told her, you have to go to Rome. You're the Pope. You sit in the chair of St. Peter. Don't be a wimp. The church needs you to go to Rome. And she fought, he finally listened to her. He went to Rome because she told him to. And um, she also told Pope Gregory that she called for a crusade. Christians were suffering hardships in foreign lands. And she said, you know, we, 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 need, we need to have a crusade. She also, when after Pope Gregory had been in Rome for a while, and, and uh, she went to see him. He called her to, 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 to see her again. Um, he warned, she warned him of the sins of the, the, what they call back then the Roman court, the curia. He said to her, he, he, she said to him, or rather it says, in the course of their talk, Catherine of Siena bewailed the fact that at the Roman court, which should have been a paradise of heavenly virtues, there was the stench of all the vices of hell. She told the Pope that. And the Pope was a little shocked because she'd only been in Rome like for a short time, of just a few days, and he, he asked her, how do you know about what's going on here, here in, the, in the Roman court? And they said her demeanor changed, and she, she all of a sudden, with, with, a, with an authority, with a power, said to her, I could smell from miles away the stench of the sins being committed in this place, and they're still happening. And they said it silenced the Pope because the Pope knew it was true. 
And so she wasn't afraid. She was not afraid. She was not anxious. She said it the way it was. Anyways, she, she challenged, challenged the Pope, challenged the, the church on so many things. Um, the Pope would send her on diplomatic missions. There was tensions. There was divisions. It was a time of, you know, uh, a, a lot of uh, strife. And rather than send a cardinal or a bishop, she would send her to work out peace. Because he, he, the Pope knew she was respected, and he hoped that because she was a woman, they wouldn't kill her. You know, seriously, she was fearless. She would go, and she went back down. This is, they say she was the most powerful person of the time, the, the most significant public figure of the time, bar none. A power, fat, powerful um, woman of God, totally in love with God, uncompromising, she was criticized a lot for traveling so much. So many people said it's not a woman's place to be out traveling and dealing with politicians and church leaders. A woman's place is at home. And she says, yeah, but that's not what Jesus told me. And there was one time where Pope, Pope Gregory again summoned her. He needed her help in, in, in Rome. And, and it, it was communicated through, through her spiritual director. And she said, listen, you're going to have to get me a letter from the Pope because I'm getting so much criticism for my traveling. People are saying I'm just kind of, you know, whatever, looking for attention. I'm not going to go unless the Pope gives me a letter so I can tell people, look, the Pope, the Pope himself asked me. I'm just being obedient. And finally she got that letter, so off she went with her big crowd of people. <laughs> and she had to tell some people, listen, just stay home. There's too many people going ev everywhere I go. And so a powerful woman of God, unparalleled, in the history of the church, no woman has had so much influence with the popes, with the, with the leadership of the church. As, as a 20-year-old young woman, again, she died at the age of 33. She was so conformed to, to, to Christ, it's, 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 it's remarkable. Um, she even talked Pope Urban into walking bare feet to one of the churches in Rome. That's how much influence uh, and authority she had as a holy woman of God. Now, St. Catherine of Siena, and I say this again just to give perspective, she wasn't able to fix the church. As a matter of fact, after she died, there was what's known as, or I don't know if it was just the time of her death, that the church fell into what's known as the Great Schism where the cardinals weren't happy with Urban because they felt he was a little too strict. So they got together again. They said, we changed our mind. We declared the first papal election void, and they elected what they called a new pope, what we call the anti-pope. And there was two popes in the church for guess how many years? 45 years. Two popes. No one's exactly sure who the right pope is. You think we have it tough right now? The church has been through tough times. The church has been through turbulent waters, through, through, through difficult times, uh, but the Lord calls us not to lose hope and certainly don't leave the church. Certainly don't leave the church. When Catherine was dying, she was asked, why to have hope? Blessed Raymond asked her, tell me, dear mother, what will happen to the church after all these disasters? This was her reply. She answered, and listen, let's let this word be a now word for us today. After all these tribulations and miseries, in a way beyond all human understanding, God will purify Holy Church by awakening the spirit of the elect. This will lead to such an improvement in the church of God and such a renewal in the lives of her holy pastors that at the mere thought of it, my spirit exalts in the Lord. The bride who now is ugly and ill-clothed will then, as I have told you often before, be most beautiful, adorned with precious gems and covered with the diadem of all the virtues. All the faithful will rejoice to be honored by such pastors, and even unbelievers attracted by the sweet odor of Jesus Christ will return to the Catholic fold and be converted to the true pastor and bishop of their souls, the Lord Jesus. Give thanks to the Lord, therefore, 
who after the tempest will give his church a period of splendid calm. One last word about what St. Catherine of Siena taught. Though she knew very well and understood the corruption in the church and some of the vile sins, even of some of the leaders in the church, the Lord taught her to always show reverence for the Lord's anointed. Even if a priest falls out of grace, even if a bishop, a cardinal falls out of grace, yes, they need to be brought to justice. Yes, they need to be removed from authority. But in some mysterious way, they're still the Lord's anointed. There's still an indelible mark on their soul. They're still in some way configured to Christ. And the Lord taught her. There is a, he said there was to be no lessening of reverence for them notwithstanding their failings. I think that the best thing we can do for the leaders of our church, including myself, all of us, the best thing you can do for us is, is, is to please keep praying for us. Pray for the leaders of the church. Pray for the Pope. Brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus founded the Catholic Church. Amen. And he will never abandon his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Viva Cristo Rey. Viva la Virgen Maria. Viva la Iglesia Católica.